And we're back again, continuing on with water, but this time we're going to start on chapter 14. Okay, so in chapter 13, we looked at how things dissolve in water. So either by forming hydrogen bonds, by forming ion dipole bonds in the dissociation of ionic compounds, or ionizing by reacting with water to form new ions. And then we looked at precipitation reactions where we use solubility rules to tell us what was soluble and what wasn't soluble, i.e. what would form a precipitate. We're going to look a little bit more deeply into solubility now and look at the things that affect solubility and more deeply into that idea that we talked about that solubility is a scale. It's not a on-off kind of a thing um, that we're going to be talking about. So the key knowledge that we need to understand about solubility according to Vika is being able to experimentally determine the factors that affect crystal formation um, and we will look at doing some of this um, in prax. Um, the use of solubility tables and experimental measurements of solubility in grams per 100 grams of water at this stage. Um, and then the quantitative relationship between temperature and solubility of a given solid, liquid or gas in water, and then how we can use solubility curves, which is plots of the solubility of a substance at different temperatures, to predict um, whether or not things will crystallize out and different aspects to do with crystallization. So the first thing that we really need to do is tie down our definition for solubility. We know that solubility is the maximum amount of substance that can be dissolved in a given quantity of solvent um, and it's still being homogeneous. Okay, so this still allowing things to be completely dissolved into the solvent producing a solution. Okay, so the solubility of the substance changes with temperature, generally increasing for most substances. This isn't for everything, for, but for most substances it would. And you can think about this if you take a spoonful of sugar and try to mix it into ice cold water, it's not going to dissolve very well. But if you make it hot water, like if you're making a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, that sugar will dissolve far more quickly and easily for the same amount of sugar and the same amount of water. Okay, so our definition is that the solubility is the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a given quantity of solvent. Typically, when we're talking solubility in terms of chemistry and in this chapter, we will talk about 100 grams of solvent when we're talking solubility. So there are different levels of solubility, as we said, and they produce different types of solutions. This is another sort of basically a definition thing. So you need to know these definitions. One is a saturated solution. This is a solution where no more solute can be dissolved at a particular temperature. And this diagram here shows sort of what happens. In this, we have solid salt at the bottom. Okay, and these arrows are indicating that um, as one comes down, another will go up. This is because this is a saturated solution. It has the maximum amount, amount that can be dissolved into the solution, which means if we add more solute in, it's just going to fall through the solution and start to layer down the bottom here, okay, because no more can be dissolved into solution. So what we end up with is a situation is if we get more barium sulfate coming out of solution, then some will dissolve back in. The concentration of it in a saturated solution is going to be constant. Okay, because I can't get, physically can't fit any more solute, solute into the solvent. An unsaturated solution, however, is one where more solute is able to dissolve at a particular temperature. Remembering that temperature alters solubility. So if I cool it down, I would get less. If I heat it up, I'd be able to get more. So when we're talking about solubility, we're always talking about a particular temperature. Okay, because temperature does affect solute solubility. Okay, so it's a particular temperature. So an unsaturated is one where I could get more in. So if I dissolved one tablespoon of sugar into um, a cup of water, say 250 mils, that would be unsaturated. I could still dissolve more sugar into that solution before I ended up with a saturated solution. 
okay? And then a supersaturated solution is one where more solute is being dissolved than is normal at the particular temperature, and it's only possible with some substances. Generally, what we would do is take a saturated solution, heat it a little bit, add some more, and then let it cool really, really slowly. And when we do this, we end up with a fairly unstable solution. Anything that could seed crystallization, and we'll talk about seeding crystallization a little bit later, will cause crystals to form. Okay, and you've seen this in the hand warmers that have the little disc inside. When you pop the disc, you see rapid formation of crystals, and that's because the solution inside the hand warmer is a super saturated solution. When you pop that disc, what happens is rapid crystallization occurs because we go from a liquid or a aqueous solution very quickly to a solid, that energy going from a higher energy state to a lower energy state needs to go somewhere and it is felt as warmth in the hand warmer. Okay, and this happens because we have a supersaturated solution and supersaturated solutions are unstable and readily form crystals. Okay, not everything can form a stable supersaturated solution, but some compounds can. Crystallization temperature is the temperature that we can take a solution to where crystals start to form. Usually we do this from a saturated solution. So if a saturated solution at room temperature, if I filter out all the solid and just have the solution, if we lower the temperature, at a certain point, remembering that solubility decreases with lowering temperature, okay, as we lower the temperature, there will be a point where we start to see crystals forming in that solution, okay? And this is our crystallization temperature, okay? It's where we start to see the crystals form. If we were to plot um, the solubility of compounds at different temperatures, what we create is a solubility curve. These curves show us the relationship between solubility and temperature and they, the reading of them allows us to sort of estimate where our saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated would occur for different substances. Each point along the solubility curve, so the line that forms the graph, okay, represents a saturated solution. So on sodium nitrate here, at uh, 40 degrees C, I could draw a line, that a dot that is on that line, and then bring it out to my y-axis, and this is going to be approximately 105. And so at 40 degrees C, I would be able to get 105 grams of sodium nitrate in per 100 grams of water, okay? And this would make a saturated solution of sodium nitrate. If I was to put more in than the 105 grams, that would make it a super saturated solution. So this region above the line is gonna be super saturated. Any region below the, that line is going to be unsaturated. Okay, so I could get more in. So if I dissolved 90 grams of sodium nitrate into 100 grams of water, because that's what my y-axis is here, at 40 degrees, this would be an unsaturated solution. Okay, because I would still be able to get in another 15 grams, there's 15 grams of sodium nitrate that I could still potentially dissolve into that solution to make it saturated. Okay, so I could fit in more if I had 90, so it would be an unsaturated solution. So when we look at solubility curves, any point on the line refers to a saturated solution. Any point above the line that we're looking at would be a supersaturated solution. And any point below the line would be an unsaturated solution. This means we can do some calculations. And this one's taken from your textbook and is the worked example. 
Okay, so we're going to go through it and I will leave you with the try it yourselves to have a look at. This is a standard solubility curve. This is the one from your textbook. Okay, um, and with these you would always be provided with a solubility curve. You can see here sodium chloride, the solubility doesn't change much with temperature, um, but things like sucrose, which is our sugar, okay, or silver nitrate. These silver nitrate is highly influenced by temperature, but only becomes soluble um, at 120 degrees C, so below this it wouldn't be soluble. Okay, so we have these lines here. So it says use figure 14.1.2, which is our solubility curve, to find how many grams of sodium nitrate will dissolve in 100 grams at 50 degrees C. We're going to use a ruler because it's a graph. We would go to 50 degrees C. We place a dot on our line, finding the sodium nitrate one, which is my yellow line. So this dot here, okay, and this is how many grams of sodium nitrate will dissolve Okay, so this is talking about making a saturated solution because that's going to be the most we could dissolve in. So at this point, I'm going to be able to see that it would be 120 grams. 120 grams of sodium nitrate would dissolve into 100 grams of water. Okay, and Double check your axis here. This is actually 100 grams. If this axis was 50 grams, I would double it to find out how much would dissolve into 100. So the next one that we have a look at says an 80 gram sample of sodium nitrate. So I have, I'm on the same yellow curve, is added to 200 mils of water at 20 degrees C. Remembering this will be using that uh, 100 mils is going to be equal to 100 grams or close enough to. Okay, and we're now going to have a look and it says how much more sodium nitrate must be added to make the solution saturated. So the first thing that I'm going to do is find the saturated solubility, okay, for sodium nitrate at 20 degrees C. And I'm going to, that's going to be about 95 Okay, it would be 95 grams per 100 grams of water. Okay, and I want 200. Okay, so this would be 190 grams per 200 to make a saturated solution. 80 grams has been added, so 190 minus 80. 110 grams more of sodium nitrate is required to make a saturated solution. Okay, so this is how we can use a solubility curve. Have a look at chapter 14.1, okay, and think about how you might prepare a solubility curve for a substance in a laboratory. How would you design an experiment to actually prepare one of these curves? Okay, so from that, this is what we look at when we're looking at solubility at the molecular level. For an unsaturated solution, essentially there are more spaces available in the solution to be able to fill. For a saturated solution, um, for every one that comes off, one would need to go down. The, it's as pos full as it can possibly be. With a supersaturated solution, remember we have filled the solution to an unstable level. So as soon as we add a nucleation or a C crystal, a rough edge that crystals could form on, straight away we will see crystallization form. We don't need to reduce the amount of solvent or anything else like that. We're going to see crystals straight away because the solution is unstable. Okay, and this are the, these are the types of solutions we need to be able to define when we're talking solubility. I'm going to stop this video here. Remember to practice those questions from the textbook. And our next video will look at crystallization and the things that affect crystallization as a result of solubility.